everyone to the CASU software seminar today. And our speaker today is uh, Franz Peschel. Um, he will talk about uh, open PMD today and very curious about this. And maybe other people will be curious about this too. Um, so Franz is joining us um, or has joined us this week in the professional support team. And maybe you can say a few things about your background before we start with your talk. Yeah, thank you. So hi together. Um, as Attila has already said, I have uh, started this week at CASA, so I'll just take the chance to say hello again. Um, I have already been working quite a bit on OpenPMD over at Wassendorf at the HZDR, and now that I have finished my um, studies in computer science, I'm starting here at CASUS. Um, on the slides, you already also see Axel Hübel, who has provided some of the slides and has been my former supervisor and is also heavily involved in OpenTMD. So if you start using OpenTMD, you are probably going to get one or two. Um, so let's... Uh, for, uh, um, so um, the way I'm going to structure this is I'm going to give a little introduction on what OpenTMD is. Um, then in the next part, I'm going to be talking a bit on current trends in I.O. and how we are positioning OpenPMD within those trends. And in the end, I'm going to give a little hands on um, with the um, OpenPMD API and also the OpenPMD viewer. All right, let's start. So what is OpenPMD? Um, can, oh, okay. I can read, that's all right. Um, so OpenPMD, PMD, that's short for Particle Mesh Data. So it's a data standard for physics data, as is produced by multiple simulations that output the data in a way that can be described by particles and by meshes. Um, as I've already mentioned, I'm working mainly on the OpenPMD API, now within the professional support team. And the OpenPMD API is somewhat the flagship implementation of the OpenPMD standard. And on one hand, it, uh, it allows to describe part of the mesh data in um, currently C++ and Python, and implements that uh, data description within several backends, such as Alias 1 or 2, HD5, and JSON. On the left-hand side, you already see a data set in HD5. What you can already see is the hierarchical structure of OpenPMD. Um, Another example would be a data set in RDS2. This one has been produced by Picon GPU. On the top, you see the um, n-dimensional data sets for heavyweight data. Um, it's not really heavyweight in this example, 123 particles. So that's not a lot, it's just a toy example. But in general, that's where your terabytes and petabytes are going to be going. On the bottom, you see um, additional attributes which um, adds self-descriptiveness to the data sets. I'm going to come back to what this means uh, later on. And you also see the hierarchical data organization in a different structure now in the alias2 backend. And the JSON backend, which is probably going to be useful if you um, start using the OpenPMD API and just want to learn it. So you don't have to learn two things at once. Um, just the OpenPMD API and not some other heavyweight backend. Uh, backend. Um, also, it's part of the package, so you don't need to install anything separately. It comes with the OpenPMD API. It's also used for debugging and prototyping. It's less useful for parallelism and has been written with the wonderful uh, JSON library for C++ by Nils Lohmann. Um, just in order to stress this once again, what our um, main objectives are with the OpenPMD API and what we think is important about it. On the one hand, I have already said you have a high level data description. And on the other hand, this data description is implemented in a hopefully efficient way. So um, high level data description means you can express your mesh data in a unified and hopefully intuitive way, and in a way that it is standardized and portable. Portability also includes um, having general unit systems, so you can actually um, share your data sets between different teams, between different applications. 
and have them be interpretable in general. Also, what is important, we don't strive only to be an I.O. library. We don't want to be only a serialization, but the data sets need to be human readable. So that's what has given me the chance to give these screenshots of the data sets in the previous slides. So human readable means also without using the OpenGMD API, you should, a, should be able to interpret what the data sets are. On the other hand, since this particle mesh data is in many simulations going to be a lot of data, stuff needs to be implemented in an efficient way, uh, also in a file format agnostic way. So um, different ways for data storage, data transport. Um, the OpenPMD API can be used on small laptops, as you're going to see later on, as well as on big machines. And of course, just like things need to be human readable, they need to be machine readable as well. And the idea is to connect these two cornerstones um, very uh, loosely and decouple them from one another. So the implementation is independent from the data description and backends can be interchanged at runtime and be fine-tuned further by um, JSON configuration or environment variables. We are going to see that in the hands-on part later on. So that's going to look somewhat like this in the Python API, for example. Um, the serious object is the entry point to the um, OpenPMT API. And you pick your backend by just adding a different file name extension. So that's H5 for HDF5, BP for RDS2, which is short for binary pack, the standard file based engine in RDS2, and JSON for JSON, obviously. Um, now, a bit on the hierarchy on OpenPMD and how the standard is structured. As we've already seen, the serious object is the entry point to the um, OpenPMD standard, or in this case, the serious group within the OpenPMD standard, as we call it. The group is what you would call a folder on file system, effectively. So one series encompasses all of your um, dumped data. That means all of your one series consists of several iterations. In some simulations, you will also see the name time steps. And <clears throat> iterations can be um, put out in a group-based way. That means you get one file containing all of your iterations, and in a file-based way, meaning one file for each iteration. Um, it depends on the backend which one is more efficient. And being a particle mesh data, one iteration now consists of meshes as well as particle species, mesh, meshes such as, for example, magnetic fields, electrical fields, particle species such as electrons, ions. Since particle species can be described by several kinds of heavyweight data sets, we get one further in direction to um, get positions, the momentums, positions, offsets, and so on. And since things may be multidimensional, one further level of indirection, for example, to get the X, Y, Z components. And on the bottom, you see in blue, um, this is not a group anymore. This is heavyweight data sets. So again, where your terabytes are going to be going. And uh, those data sets, um, they can also be, for example, if you're describing position offsets, may, it might be that all of the data is the same. So you can describe this in a lightweight way, but in general, those will be high, uh, heavyweight. You can use mixed precision. And a recent addition has been the, the addition of complex numbers. Um, in green, again, you see the open team, the attributes which are used for self-descriptiveness, conversion, and descriptive description. They can be added to groups as well as for data sets. <coughs> and my voice is leaving me. So some example for uh, records. Um, you have, for example, electrical fields that are in general described by vectors. So you get X, Y, and Z components. As opposed to temperatures, they are still meshes, but they don't have a direction. So you would lose one level of indirection. And for electrons, this is an example where we describe the positions by X, Y, and Z components. So just some examples from what we've seen just now. Now for attributes, uh, an example, um, 
is, for example, the unit system. So units are a good application for attributes to add lightweight meta information on your data. And I think this should not be too much of a surprise. Things are described by certain base SI um, units. And you can, but need not furthermore um, use an unit I, unit SI attribute in order to give some scaling factors. So the general software stack of the Open PMD API, um, we have several um, packages and several packaging systems such as Spec, Conda, or of course module systems on several clusters. Um, the API itself is written in C++ and provides um, frontends in C++ and Python. We're going to see the Python API later on. And there are ongoing discussions on further um, front-end languages. So if you are interested in that, um, head over to our GitHub and get involved. I've already talked about the I.O. libraries and things are runnable in general on Linux, Unix, OS 10 and Windows. So I'm going to go to the next part, which is um, I.O. trends. So this is already a bit of an older graph. Um, those are simulations that have been run on Titan. Uh, in green, you see the effective I.O. throughput um, by using HDF5. And in blue, you see the effective I.O. throughput by using Adios. And one thing that already shows is the choice of backend is important. So actually having this um, switchability between the different backends is a good thing to have. And one further thing, um, the largest simulation that was run in this example uh, wrote one petabyte of data at 10,000 nodes. So we get into an area where things are really heavyweight. And this trend is confirmed by some of these calculations. Also, some these calculations stem from some bit older machines. Uh, in 2013, um, you were able to um, produce 60 gigabyte per second at maximum per node. Um, that is just compute output. So what our GPUs are doing. Now, if we want to put the data out, we already get a slowdown by a factor of 10 if writing data through the PCI Express. And this is now an extreme calculation for extreme scale. So at full scale, what these calculations does do for IO output per node is take the general global um, throughput that the IO system can do divided by number of nodes and we get 42 megabyte on Titan per second, 29 on Pittsburgh. So the trend is that this is slowing down. This means roughly a difference of a factor of 2000 between IO output per node and compute output per node. And things are getting worse. So for summit, the ratio is somewhere at 10 to the four. This means we are at a point where we need a solution. One solution that people have been looking into um, is Compression, I'm not going to go into full detail on this slide. I just want to give some general hints. This is a research that has been done by Axel Hübel. And the performance ratio, as you see on the bottom right, is the time of reduced I.O. divided by the time of unreduced I.O. So if we, have got, if we want to speed up through compression, we want to be below one. And two takeaways from this are, first, you can get a speed up by using compression, but you have to configure things in the correct way. If you do things wrong, you get a speed down. Second point, we get a speed up of, in this case, maybe two at most, and that's nowhere near where we need the speed up because we have a difference of 10,000. So what we need are wonders, and these are not wonders. So in order to achieve wonders, um, we need to change our overall workflows. And this is what I have been trying for my master thesis. Uh, for my master thesis, I have been implementing a prototype workflow um, that is in some way um, typical for our domain. So simulation pipeline from the simulation that 
produces data which will later be anal analyzed by a little analysis code. Um, in this case, GAPT, which is a scattering analysis that only reads particle data. And the way this traditionally goes often is roughly this way. You run your simulation, dump all your data to disk. In the second step, when you have finished your simulation, load all that data in again, analyze it, and put out the result again. In the case of GAP, this is a scattering plot, so not really a lot of data. And the idea is, if we don't actually need those intermediate results, but we are interested in the final results, what we could, for example, do is stream things and by this way um, circumvent the persistent storage. And as I've already mentioned, the data description in OpenPMD is independent of implementation. So the ideal is we keep the same data description, but just toggle the streaming aware backend in order to be able to store only the final results persistently. Now, things are obviously not always as easy as I'm making them out to be. We get new challenges. For example, data distribution gets more and more important. Um, on the left-hand side, you see the parallel processes of the writing application, in our case, Pigma GPU. On the right-hand side, the parallel processes of the reading application. And now what we want for a data distribution is for things to be distributed locally, so you don't want data written here, sent to over the here, but data should be exchanged somewhat locally, uh, somewhat in a balanced way, so not one reading process gets double the amount of data of the other one, and things should be roughly aligned in order to uh, not split up the data just randomly, but read it somehow in the pattern that it has also been produced. This chart um, proves the importance of local uh, data distribution. So this is a throughput per process. In the ideal case, we get a, an even um, graph, even line. On the bottom, you see um, file I/O. so that's the least throughput that I got. In the middle, you get non-local streaming where data is exchanged between several nodes. And on the top, we get throughput for local streaming where data is exchanged only within the same node. The further difficulty is scheduling. <clears throat> so um, things are going uh, more and more asynchronous. We have in Picon GPU asynchronously uh, the um, IO plugin and the simulation. We have um, the two codes running asynchronously. And in GAP, the same thing all over again. So um, we get some implicit pipeline parallelism through all of this um, streaming approach, but configuring things in an efficient way such that resources are actually utilized and not one code is most of the time just waiting is not easy. Um, this one is a little easier example, which I've been um, trying out recently. Um, so what if we still actually want to just do the traditional thing, run a simulation and dump data to disk? One thing that we see in a lot of um, simulations, and Pico GPU is no exception to this one, is that the I.O. routines are not perfectly asynchronous to these simulations. So writing to disk will often needlessly block your simulation. What we can do to solve this now is just launch up a separate tool, stream our data into that separate, to separate tool asynchronously, and now this tool writes to, to a disk. Of course, this does not increase our I.O. times, but we can hide them pretty well this way. The drawback is, of course, um, that we require more main memory by spawning a second tool, but the pro is we need no changes in the code at all. Um, before I'm going to start our um, little hands-on session, now an outlook for what we are planning to do in the next time is, for example, to use the streaming workflow for um, machine learning, because machine learning um, obviously often needs a lot of data. So for creating surrogate models of PIC on GPU, 
plan is to run several Bitcoin GPU simulations in parallel and stream the outputs into a surrogate modeler in order to not have this, this many data on disk, because a lot of data is not something that you want having on disk. And in this way, circumvent the I.O. problem again. All right, I'm going to start with some little demonstrations. Over here, um, you see on the left-hand side, um, the OpenPMD API, Python side of the OpenPMD API um, that writes a little data set. And on the right-hand side, you see um, the Python script that reads the same data set again. So what you already see is the Python API interacts heavily with uh, NumPy. And we have already seen the entry point to uh, the OpenPMD API as the serious object. So this is where we start the, into the OpenPMD API. Um, by giving the file name plus extension, we are choosing the backend, which in this case is RDS2. Um, we want to create a file. And as I've already said, we can pass um, parameters to the backend by using a little JSON-based configuration. Um, a little warning, the older backends are mainly configured um, by environment variables for now, so this is not yet fully implemented. Uh, the next part are just some metadata preparations that we are going to apply to our data sets. And what this does is it just puts out 100 iterations, so 100 times we produce an iteration. Within that iteration, we create a particle um, species E for electrons, and we just want to write their positions and nothing else. So we create some dummy data. And are you having a question? Yes. Uh, one of the questions uh, I just see, uh, can, can you also load this information uh, from, from file, the text information that you're providing, or is this all in the code? So the description um, up there. This, uh, uh, yeah, the config. Um, the um, OpenPMD API does not really care where this configuration comes from, but it does not lo load from files automatically, so you will have to load them yourself. Okay, but that is possible. Yeah. It would be nice to actually have that feature, because I think a lot of people are used to provide some kind of uh, uh, file description that they just can't ed can edit without actually touching the code all the time. Uh, it should not be a huge problem to add that in just, yeah. Okay. It can be doable, yeah. Okay, just, sorry for, for interrupting, but I just had a look at it. Okay, thanks. Please go on, I'm sorry. Yeah. It was just, in this example, easy to have it all in the same file. Um, actually, I wanted to ask you since, uh, so in the serious line, the next yep. one, so is that uh, stream.bp, is that somehow your input data? Um, or what is that? Uh, that is going to be the file that uh, I'm going to have on the file system later on. So that's the output. Yes, that, that's the file name. Okay. okay. I'm, I have named it stream because I'm going to later toggle the streaming backend um, in order to show that. But I'm first starting with the file backend. Um, maybe, as an, maybe as an explanation again, for streaming, you write to file and you read from file, you know? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so um, Arios actually communicates uh, between the several streaming instances via um, a file, so you can treat things as a file and they will run as a stream. Um, but we're going to see that in a minute, yeah. Like a real file, like storing data on disk or like kind of a socket? Or a socket, so yeah. there are just okay. some addresses in there. All right, so we prepare some dummy data and just put that data into the X, Y, and Z components. And in the end, we close the iteration. This will automatically flush all of our built up operations and put the data to disk actually. You can also do things manually by calling series.flush, but iteration.close is preferred, especially for um, streaming later on. And on the other hand, on the other side, we see the same thing in reverse, or maybe let's run things for now. 
So we see no data yet. We call this thing and we see the data set has been created. The BP4 engine actually writes folders and we can now use the native Adios tools to read that data set. Maybe dump things too. Or we can look at the attributes. All that stuff has been written. And now we're going to read that again. So we open things again. Now using, of course, the um, read um, access mode. Iterate through all iterations. Access the um, positions of the electrons again. Load things in here. So for the X, Y, and Z components. Again, iteration.close in order to flush things. And this is just some writing to standard out. So let's look at it. And this is what's happening. Can, can you explain uh, on based on this example the how how the, these attributes of the data are being let's say accessed? Um, so in this case, uh, we don't access attributes at all. But um, I don't have the full API in mind. But um, you would, for example, wait a minute. Um, let's just. So um, iteration, for example, is a group. Mm -hmm. So for iterations, you have, I don't know it uh, from the top of my mind, but um, for example, get DT for get data types, that's probably something that you are mm -hmm. rather going to be calling on the electron positions mm -hmm. or get timestamp or something like this. Okay. Or you have general generic calls like get attribute. So, you just have methods for all of these um, objects that represent OpenPMD groups and OpenPMD data sets. Um, you have specific methods for specific attributes defined by the OpenPMD standard. And you have a you have generic um, accessing methods for attributes that you just added yourself. So you are not restricted to only adding the attributes that are defined by the OpenPMD standard, but can also add attributes on your own. Um, can I ask something? Yeah. Uh, so if you have a user defined attribute, something like position, instead of position, I want to store some other quantity. Yeah. Then I can, in, in the writing file, I can just instead of position, write, give the name of the attribute. But where do I mention this uh, dimensionality? Like what, what is the, whether this is a vector or a scalar or so. Uh, I haven't understood the last part. Can you repeat this? Yeah. So where do I specify what is the, uh, dimension of the attribute. So if it's a scalar attribute or a vector or a tensor attribute. Um, in the Python API, you just um, give the attribute and the Python API will automatically see if it's a vector that you're giving in or if it's a uh, just a scalar number or something like this. In the C++ API, you can use um, templates in order to um, make it explicit. Oh, it will be inferred from the input that we give. Okay. Yeah. It's dimensions, isn't it? it? Dimensions? Yeah. Isn't that where you... So you, oh, you I, do this in 9.11? Uh, so um, we are talking... So this, these are not attributes here. These are um, groups. So yeah, okay. You, so, but uh, from these, it does refer those, or from, from which exactly? Or from the description? Um, I think we are talking about two separate things right now. Okay. So um, you, if if you want to, um, well, if I understood Sachin's question correctly, this was about um, specifying the data types of attributes. Uh, which... not, yeah, not the data type, but the dimension of the attribute. So uh, if it's a scalar attribute or a, a different kind of a, 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 so vector attribute, a normal field or something like yeah. that. So in that case, um, so um, we distinguish um, scalar attributes from dimensional attributes that have several um, fields by data types, meaning you have vectors of integers, for example, or just an integer. And that will be determined from the data that you just put in. And yeah, this here is. Okay. I think uh, 
the word, it's the same word dimension, but I think we're talking about two separate distinct uh, things right now. Okay, so in, in this example, uh, so in line 37, if you say just x, y, it will know that is, you're describing a two-dimensional system. Instead of, if you remove the set here in line 37. No, no as far as I understand from writing, you, you describe a data type by np.d type double. That's true? Uh, yes, for um, data, heavyweight data sets, yes. Yes, and then, then uh, you basically give over this data type in line 36, is that right? Um, mm, yes and no. Um, so this here is for NumPy. This is a NumPy function that has no um, relation for now with OpenBMD. Um, but you see that the data type is part of the data set description. Uh -huh. And that again, is used in order to um, specify how the data set is laid out. Ah, okay. That's where we bring it into OpenBMD. Okay, and how does it know that it's a three vector? Um, the data set itself doesn't not know um, because we have three different data sets, each for X, Y, and Z. Ah, okay, so you don't actually have a vector. You have three scalars here. Um, three double scalars or what? Yeah, so they, they are not scaled up, as you see, because we get uh, a vector per uh, dimension. So we have for, for dimension x, we have this here. We have this vector. For dimension y, we have this here. OK, so yeah. And for dimension z, this. So you have a SOA layout. Yes, exactly. OK. OK. And so the, the, the dimension. You have you have three three arrays and each contains uh, a certain number of particles. Right. Okay. Exactly. The X position of the particles, the Y position of the particles, and the Z position of the particles. Yes. Okay. That's that's just important to know because I think uh, Sachin thought that the dimension is three, isn't it? Right. That, that's what I. Thought. So if if you have a ten, so the, if it's a structure of array layout, then it's clear. You store each component, and then you have a vector for each particle, uh, for uh, vector which contains the values for each particle, right? Yes. Yeah, so if you want to um, store not uh, three components <coughs> but scalar value, um, I don't know the exact um, term in the Python API. So I'm mainly using the C plus plus API, but um, there's a special call that you place that um, X, for example, with, and you just call something like um, electron positions and then I hope dot scalar or something like this. So, so just to make clear, dim here in, in the read dot Python then gives me the, uh, the number of particles, so 10 or something in the read dot pi. In the dim read equals um, dimensions, I would give me the number of particles for each of these. Uh, no, that, that's just accessing this array up here. So we get X, Y, and Z again. And yeah. now we... Yeah, but dimensions uh, I gives me the number. So these are the... Just string, right? That's, that's just a string. So this is, for example, okay. dim is X. Oh, uh, dim is X. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah sorry. Um, but you can... As, in the C++ as well as in the Python API, yeah, you can call, uh, you can consider all of these um, different um, OpenPMD group types like electron positions as containers that you can just iterate over in order to... I should learn more Python yeah, and I saw what you did up there. Okay, fine. Okay. All right. So next thing that I wanted to demonstrate is just switch the backend maybe to JSON now. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if you try reading now, that's going to give an error. Um, so we first have to create the data set again. JSON is not one for speed. <laughs> now we can inspect things and see we have the same data set, but now laid out as JSON. And if we read again, 
just the same thing happens, but now it's been JSON in the backend and not RDOS 2. Oh, right. This is beautiful. So now let's switch over to the streaming backend. Um, streaming, I have to say, it's not currently um, part of OpenPMD API, so we are currently in the process of code review. It's hopefully going to get in soon, but I need to change some things in order to get there. Um, first thing that we need that I needed to change is, of course, the um, backend being used. Now it's SST for the Sustainable Staging Transport Engine of Arius 2. And then here it's um, roughly the um, implementation of streaming semantics. So I needed to change some things about the OpenPMD API because streaming is a bit stricter and we need to um, put some stricter um, descriptions on how we um, process data. In here, the only change has been exchanging the iterations um, call by a method call, which takes care of um, streaming semantics. And streaming semantics and OpenPMD um, go by a streaming iteration after iteration. So it, this is where our streaming semantics are going. Rest has, been, has stayed the same, and roughly the same changes again over at the reading end. So now we do all of that stuff again. We try reading, and it doesn't fail right away because uh, there is no file to be missing, but we see the ST engine is getting impatient. So let's start writing. And the ST engine has seen uh, there's our data set now and things have started. All right, that's been it for the OpenPMD API demo. I just want to quickly show the OpenPMD viewer because this is uh, again a Another example for why it is good to have a self-descriptive standard, because you don't need to um, call matplotlib manually and all of that, because your data sets, they know how they want to be presented, because they, pres they have all the information that is needed for um, viewing them. So actually, some tool like the OpenPMD viewer can do it automatically. And I'm not really an expert on this one, but I don't think you need to be because things are just a nice little Jupyter notebook with a little GUI. You can inspect your uh, field data by iteration. You can also um, inspect your particle data. <clears throat> and the backend for the data sorry, that you use um, doesn't matter because it's converted into the PMD format. And then and that's what this visualization notebook is looking at. Currently, um, it does actually matter because it's been written before the OpenPMD API has become somewhat stable. Um, so currently, you need to write your data to HDF5. But um, as far as I've understood, they're working on using the OpenPMD API, so it does not matter. So this here has, is a data set that I have created with Picon GPU using the OpenPMD plugin via HDF5. So, so we, had a, we had an ATA. HDF5 reader basically for OpenPMD at one point. That's yeah. where this came from. So we had this. This is basically the HDF5 reader, isn't it, uh, uh, Franz? Uh, if you are talking about libsplash, um, I looked into it and no, no, I... for 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 the for for this now. This was basically full HDF5, wasn't it? Um, I don't know how it's implemented, uh, this, this one, because I haven't touched this code myself. I can't really say anything about it. I just wanted to demonstrate it exists. Yeah. Um, just so for historical reasons, it can only read HDF5 for the moment, exactly. but I open the API is going to come and we are going to be able to read from. Yeah. That's uh, that's done by the Berkeley guys, so we don't have to. Yeah. Uh, so the particle data now is still stored in the SOA style. So we have like one array for X, one array for Y, one array for Z, uh, as in the as in the previous example. So it's stored this way, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But you you can call up one particle, a specific particle. Yeah. I guess from the particle selection, maybe. So we only have uh, one particle uh, species, but yeah. So we can. Yeah, but uh, like one specific particle out of species. Uh, particle number ten, for example. Particle selection that might. 
might be possible in here, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, you can. You can. You can uh, access a single particle. I'm not yeah, sure. Okay. And, 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 and my other question would be like, if if I now want to do like a face a space plot, for example, draw x versus uh, versus one of the velocities or momentum. <coughs> um, as I've already said, I'm not an expert on this one. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> so, no, no, Franz, it doesn't mean in the in the tool here, but uh, if you want to have a specific particle now, so yeah. you, you don't want to have x, y, z, x for all particles, but you yeah. want to have the tenth particle and you want to have x, y, z. Can you access it as an entity? So can you basically make a face-based plot, for example, or a plot of all positions? Um, and uh, like my other question would be like how self-aware this format is uh, if if I load it in like, like what are my options for visualization can I for example load it in Paraview and will Paraview understand that those X Y Z are actually uh, like which belong to to which particle like VTK for example can give you this kind of metadata so. Um, I don't know whether part of you can read from OpenTMD. Do you know? No, no Franz, Franz, the question is different. You now have an S of A layout, yeah. construct of array. Yeah. This means usually that the that the uh, that you have three long arrays. Yes. But for somebody who is looking for particles, he, they would rather lo love to have an AOS layout. Okay. So that, that, that you have one struct that you have one array but with three entries does this matter for working with the particles in terms of the pmd um yeah. it matters in that way that you need to convert um your data sets to that style that you prefer if you want if you want actually the style where you have xyz 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 in one array so um there is no explicit way to um explicitly select one particle but you have to um, load the same positions from the separate data sets. Okay, so there's no self-aware mechanism to say, this is now a particle with X, Y, Z and P, X, P, Y, P, Z. Yes. Independent of the structure of the data. Uh, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, I mean, this, like for HDF5, you can just like, like there's this XDMF XML format which describes HDF5 files. And this can actually like give you the real insight in, into what's, what's, what's stored there. So th that can tell you uh, these three are stored in separate uh, arrays in memory or on disk, but you can combine them this way to get one particle's position and, and velocity and, and stuff like this. Okay. I mean, it, it can be done just using metadata. That's why I was asking if, if some kind of information is stored there or not. Okay. So simple answer, no such uh, facility is exposed by OpenPMD AI. Okay. Uh, but the standard allows to add particles. We have particle data in the standard, don't we? I'm a bit surprised now. Yeah, it, it, because like how, how else would I, for example, plot, do a plot where each particle is represented by a dot or even better by a, by an arrow pointing uh, in, the, in the momentum direction. This, that, that, that should be possible, right? Um, so um, it's not possible directly from using just the data that you have um, but by manually converting things. Okay. Uh, no, no I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not satisfied with that answer. I think we have to revisit that one. I'm pretty sure because the, 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 the standard defines what a particle is. Uh -huh. Franz. Um, yes, so to, to, write, yes. to write a open PMD compliant format, the, the standard defines what a particle is. Doesn't uh, it? Yeah, but it also defines the SOA layout. No, it, it should be, 
I mean, I guess it should be independent of the layout. I can just like put some meta metadata in which which connects the layout with the particle. Um, so if, if that would be a needed addition, we can get to it, but it's not currently implemented as really? well. Oh, oh, okay, I, I mean. <laughs> yeah. yes. I'm, a, I'm a bit surprised about that, but I, I have to investigate as well. Yeah. I okay, let's. Uh, the technical files of the standard in my mind at the moment, so. Um, I mean, to me, <coughs> as, as people say, we have entities like a particle that has a certain meaning, you know? Yeah. And it should be in, independent of the way you're storing that. I can look into it. Yeah. I can't answer right now. Okay, that's a good one. Thank you very much. So please go on and, uh, and show us. All right, so that's, uh, I think, um, so this is just good for toying around a bit. You have the little GUI for, as we've seen, particle selections for actually selecting selecting what you want to plot and selecting how you want to plot it. So just so you are aware that it exists, um, I'm going to continue with the credits. Um, and we see again the packaging tools that we use, um, the different libraries for front and middleware and IO things um, that especially IO things I've, I've already been talking about. Languages um, and compilers, we are testing for um, Clang, GCC, and actually also Visual Studio. Um, on the bottom, you see the platforms that we are using for developing. Um, so just those as um, open source credits. And now a bit of um, environment and ecosystem around OpenPMD, who is using OpenPMD, who is powered by OpenPMD. So there are scientific simulations such as Picon GPU, WarpX, FBPIC, Simex, and many more. There are several data processing and visualization tools. We've all just now seen the OpenPMD viewer, but there are things like VisualPIC, PostPIC, the YT project, Visit. Um, libraries and language bindings. We have now seen the OpenPMD API, but also lib splash pydive and several tools and converters and little helpers, file validators, XDMF creation, HDF5 compass, and this again. So if you are intrigued, if you want to start things, just head over to our GitHub. You will also see the projects list that I have just presented. You will see the technical files for the standard. You will see the OpenPMD <coughs> viewer some example data sets and so on. And oh, we also have a read the docs for the OpenPMD API. So that's nice for having a slow start. And thank you for joining me today. And that's it from my side.